on. How was that for you? Superb. <laughs> well, how long have you been a collector of fizzies, John? Probably about four years this time. First time was in 1975 when I bought my first one. Right, and what was that? Was that the same model as you've got here? With DX? Uh, this, is a, this, this, this is a drum brake one. The first one I had was a, an early DX. The, the same, the same paint lines, same badge, but it was yellow and it was uh, had the disc brake. Right, and you've actually got quite a collection, haven't you, at the moment? Yeah, I've got 17 altogether. <laughs> right, in all various shapes and forms. Yeah. yeah. And your, your plan is obviously to restore and renovate them? Yeah, I, I started initially four years ago with one to, uh, to restore identical to the one I had in 1975, right. but um, it's just escalated. I ended up with 17. Uh, all of mine are the, the pedal models with the, uh, the screw-on tank badges. Four of them are DXs, and the rest of them are drum brake. How do you find the parts for them? Uh, there's, a, there's quite a network of people who are restoring these, and there's a lot of swapping going on. Um, also, eBay is, is quite good, but it, it tends to be quite expensive. Yeah, do you find there's a lot of people use eBay and that tends to push the prices up? It does, yeah. There's a lot of people who seem to have quite a lot of parts who, who know that the, uh, they're, there's a, quite a collector, but they're quite collectible. And uh, so consequently the prices go up, especially on the early models. What do you think are the hardest parts to source for the bikes that you collect? On the models I've got, the hardest parts are the tank badges and also the seats. Yeah, so who does all your paintwork? A friend of mine does it. He he match, He's able to match all the colours. He's uh, he gets all the dents and scratches out and makes a nice job of it. Mm. And what do you do with regards to the chrome work? You obviously have to get that re-chromed, or if it's gone too far, you obviously get it like new new parts or pattern parts. Some of it you can get re-chromed. This one does need a bit of work. It needs a new front mud guard. Uh, it's got the pedal gear missing, but that's all to go on. The, um, the a lot of it can be re-chromed. I've even found a place that will, in, will re-chrome the indicators, which, because they're a sort of a, a cast aluminium, they were very hard to get re-chromed, but I can get them successfully done now. How far do you normally go with a restoration? Do you take it right the way down, or do you just tie, tidy them up? Sometimes it's very tempting to tidy them up, but almost, it, well, in all cases with mine, I've had to take them back to, to completely to, to the beginning. The frames, starting with the frames, they have to be sandblasted and painted or stove enamelled. So really, you've got to take the whole thing to pieces. So, I mean, when you go to look, look at one uh, that you're possibly going to buy, I mean, is there anything you won't buy? It depends on the frame number. If it's, if it's a, a 394 being a drum brake one or a 596 being a disc brake model, I'll, I'll buy those. If it's a later one uh, then, and it's dressed up to look like one of these, then I, I won't have it because it's, it's, it's pointless trying to put all the parts on, a, on the wrong frame. Right, so you're basically looking to keep them as standard and as original as, as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to use pattern parts from time to time. The uh, the original parts, like the, the rear mud guards, are very hard to get, and the tank badges. Some of the front mud guards are hard to get. There's um, you can get a lot of pattern parts, but there's, they're always slightly different. Right, so this is obviously one that you're going to restore, John. I mean, what, what have you got plans for this, for example? Well, this is a this is a good one to to restore because it's one owner from new. Uh, it's generally all there. Although it's in poor condition, the whole thing's got to be stripped down to, to the basic frame and started again. But the, the biggest problem with FS1Es is the, the owners, the young owners, who chop bits off, change things. So with regards to the, the FS1E and the SS, I mean, what basically is the difference? Well, this is, a, this is an FS1E. It's, uh, this is a 75 model. It's an early, early drum brake model with the, with the tank badges. Yeah. The one behind is a, it's actually got the wrong side panel on it, but this is a 73 SS. The only difference between it was the, the, the badge, badge, the name FS1E, and the colour. And this was the candy gold, and this is the popsicle pur purple. Yeah. How much would you likely be able to spend on doing this purple one? To buy this one would probably set you back about five hundred pounds. Right. What in the condition it's in now? As it is now. Um, to restore it, you're probably looking at another five hundred plus. Right. Okay. To to get it to get it completely right. There's so there's a lot on here that's that's really can can only be thrown away now. The exhaust. Um, 
Uh, Your rear mud guards are obviously split there. I mean, that's not really salvageable, is it? Or? No, this, this rear mud guard is, is, uh, is beyond repair. It's broken here. It's cracked here on both sides. And that has, has really had it. The problem is that it's got the original tunnel, which is uh, the pattern ones don't have. Although there are some, some coming out, pattern parts with the tunnel on them. Uh, but, I mean, many people who would go for a restoration, um, whether it be a fizzy, whether it be anybody, I mean, is this basically what you would call a basket case, or is this a, a generally pretty a, a good one to start restoration on? I wouldn't consider this to be a basket case because it's. it's is it a runner? This one runs, yeah. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, it's. As I said, it's one owner from new, and it's basically complete. It hasn't been modified, so it's, it's got the correct forks on it, it's got the correct wheels, correct engine, the, the, the frame and engine number match. It's, uh, it's a very good starting point. How far would you normally travel to pick up a fizzy? This one, um, this one I bought in Cambridge. Uh, I've been as far as Liverpool, Exeter, uh, Bath. Would that be care of eBay, uh, finding them on eBay, or have you, have you got contacts in on, on the uh, websites that you visit? Well, some, some have come through contacts on, on the website, on the FS1E website. These two actually came from eBay. Well, what about this one, Joe? I mean, what, what's involved in this one? Well, this is a 73 SS. Even though it's got FS1E on the side, it's actually an SS. This one has been heavily altered by various owners at some stage. It's got, for example, it's got the ignition switch up here. The wiring loom has been completely chopped to, to accommodate that. It's got the wrong handlebars. It's got a, an auto loop system, which was not never fitted to, to this age of, of bike. That side panel was replaced with a, an oil tank. Uh, it's got the wrong carburetor, There's, so it goes on. But it, at least it's got a V5. What do you do with regard to the engines? Do you actually strip the engines down or are you just looking at a cosmetic job? Well, this one is a non-runner. Um, I've yet to discover the reason for it. Apart from anything else, it's seized. Uh, so this will have to have to come to pieces and start again. Quite often on these you have to change the, the main crank bearings and certainly all the oil seals. But it's being a single cylinder two stroke, it's it's quite a straightforward engine to work on. I mean I've heard stories of these in the past where people put in vegetable oil in to run of a two stroke oil. Yeah, they they unfortunately in their early life they're they're quite abused. Uh, but I think Yamaha only intended them to be to last probably ten years maximum. So uh, any that are still running now have, have done done pretty well. How many have you actually got up and running all together at the moment? Do you want to answer that honestly? <laughs> <laughs> it's just just the one, Joey. <laughs> no, I mean, how long do you reckon the restorations are going to take you? Is it an ongoing passion, or is it something which you're actually actively trying to keep on top of? It's it's an ongoing thing. It, it's it's something that escalated really from from having the first one. Um, it's become almost an obsession, and it's it's a it's a hobby, but it's uh, it's something I enjoy doing. So it's uh, it's a labour of love more than anything. Right, obviously this is your spares uh, little haven, John. I mean, what sort of stuff have you got in here? I've pretty well got just about everything I I want really, but uh, I still seem to want to go out to auto jumbles to, to my, buy more parts and every so often you get lucky and you get brand new parts like that which uh, have been obsolete for some time and uh, things like this which you just can't can't buy anymore mm. are these uh, sort of old stock off of uh, like dealers or that have been laying in the back of shelves for years and years or well there's I've got a box full of stuff down there which was uh, as a result of a, a motorcycle dealer moving premises and they came across a load of uh, load of parts and told me about it, and I went down and bought the lot. A lot of your parts on your shelf there seem to have been refurbished. Who actually does them? Do you do them yourself or? Um, engine casings, for example. That's that's just been that's been sandblasted and then stove enamelled to to give it uh, the original finish. So you you put new new oil seals in that, and that's ready for use again. I suppose. That's you. right. Yeah. Um, on the on the shock absorbers, one of the biggest problems is. Uh, the chrome sections, rust, and Yamaha only sold those as, as a one-piece item. So I've uh, I've been buying Honda, Pete, Honda shock absorbers from Breakers Yards, and they fit 
exactly the same. So they are, you can strip them, the shock absorbers down then, can yeah. you? Yeah, you undo, there's a nut on the bottom there, you undo that, and pull the whole thing to pieces. Are those sort of uh, parts, are they now obsolete then, to buy the originals? Yes, they yeah, are. These, these, are, these are now obsolete along with uh, tank badges, um, mug guards, all sorts of parts. So that little tip there for the uh, shroud there, the silver shroud, is quite a good idea for Yeah. Yeah, the only thing you have to watch is that the hole is the hole on the bottom is a different size, and there's a nut that holds it on, which is in there, and on the Honda it's bigger, so it's worth changing the nut, even changing the spring if you can, and then putting it back together with the new casing. And What's actually involved inside that? Is it just a spring or is it hydraulic? It's uh, I think it's, it's an oil oil filled chuck absorber. Right, and is that part accessible still? Can no. You still buy that? You can't buy no. It? The whole thing, it, it came as a one piece item, you could, couldn't buy the parts for it. Right. So uh, refurbishing them is, is the only answer. Right, you've got this uh, Beige Brown one here, John. I mean, what's the story behind this one then? Well, this one's a this one's, uh, work in progress. It's, uh, it's all been taken to pieces and the frame's been repainted. Uh, so you've actually taken this one, it's, it was like the one we saw earlier on outside. It was in pretty much in that sort of condition was it or? Yeah I, I got this one as a as a gold one and it had the wrong it had a later front end on it so it had the wrong forks and the wrong front wheel. Um, taken it to pieces, sandblasted it, had it stove enamelled, same with the swinging arm. The side panels have been resprayed, the shock absorbers have been overhauled. The tank that I was going to use on it is is actually an original tank but it's faded. Uh, so it will need will need painting. Uh, where, the, where the sticker peeled off, you can see the difference in the colour. Yeah, that's in pretty good condition, really. Though there's no real dents in it at all. It's in, yeah, it's in nice condition. I mean, it's, there's very little rust inside. But it'll it'll come up very well when it's painted. How would you get the rust out of the tank inside? Is there some sort of treatment they go through with it? Yeah, there's a, a coating that you can apply to the tank. You put it inside the tank, and it, it coats the tank, covers up all the rust. Who does that? You wouldn't be able to do that yourself, would you? Or could yeah, you buy that? Yeah, you buy a can of or a tin of the stuff and just put pour it into the tank. Right, and you swish it around, and within a certain amount of time, it creates a barrier. Yeah, it just forms a, 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 a film or a seal all the way around it. So, with, with a bike like you've got here, obviously un, undergoing restoration, um, w would there be any certain parts that you haven't got that you, I mean, you've obviously got quite a load of parts in, in here to, to rebuild perhaps more than one bike. Is there any parts for this one, for example, do you catalogue your list of what's on there, what's needed when you actually do a restoration? When I, when I take them to pieces, uh, all, the, all the parts that can be salvaged, I, I, I bag up, put the part numbers on the bags and keep separately. Uh, most of the parts for this one, all the, all the, all the zinc coated parts have gone off to be recoated. All the chrome parts have gone, the fork legs have already been painted. Uh, these parts are actually new, these collars here. Um, and the, those gaiters are uh, the originals, they've come up quite well. Right, so you're quite aware of the differences between the two models, John. I mean, what, what have you got in your hand there? Well, this is a good example. On, a, on an early pedal model, um, up to 1977, from 72 to 77, that's a right hand fork leg. That's the fork leg off an auto lube model. The difference is the brake plate changed sides. And so that lug that holds the brake plate in place went onto the other side. Additionally, you can see that the lugs are much wider on a later model, so the forks aren't interchangeable unless you change the whole front end. And then, then it then it takes away from being standard. This is a 75 DX tank that would originally have been in yellow, and it was wasn't in bad condition. It's quite good condition inside, but it's got a couple of dents on the top here. It's got a dent there, and really to to get it to its original condition, you need to strip all the paint off, get it back to the bare metal, and then have it filled on all the dents, take all the scratches out, and have it painted. There's obviously no rust uh, welding that needs doing on that at all, like not, holes or perforations. Or not on this one. Occasionally they can pinhole along the bottom here. This one actually needs a little bit of welding down here. But that's all been done and the tank's been tested. And so you'd actually go to the extent of getting the welding done if they, if they need it? Yes. Is there any sort of damage, like larger dents obviously, that you, you, you wouldn't entertain a, a, a rebuild on the tank? No, I've, I've had tanks that are com completely out of shape and uh, have been brought back to the original original lines. And what sort of a finish can we expect to get afterwards? Once it's taken down to the bare metal, and it's all the all the dents and scratches are taken out of it. It's going to be painted, 
and then the new decals applied. I mean, that looks virtually like a new tank. I mean, what sort of condition would that one have been in before the restoration? Same as, same as the previous one. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, you've got new badges on there, new decals. Yeah, it's got, it's got new badges on. These, I had, these decals I had made by a, a local firm, copied from an original tank. They, they get applied and then the, the whole thing's lacquered over the top to seal the decals on. And then there's the uh, warning sticker on the top there that goes on top of the lacquer, which is the 20 to 1 mix for the petrol oil. Do you actually maintain the normal colours? Is that original Yamaha colours? Yes. So you're not entertaining different colours? Or no, all the ones I've, I've, I'm restoring, I've tried, to, I've tried to do them original. So I'm, I'm going for the original colours. This, again, this would be on an early DX. So what would the early colours be then of, of the, of the fuses you actually collect and restore? Well the first SS model would have been candy gold, then that it would have been candy gold for the first FS1E after that, and then going to popsicle purple, and then the early DX was competition yellow, and at the same time the early DX came out, the drum brake model changed to barger brown. That was before the speed block type? After that it went to the speed block and they lost the tank badges. Did they maintain the same colour scheme? Obviously the purple wasn't relevant in that time. The purple and the candy gold finished before the... The, the purple and the gold finished before the, the speed block or Kenny Roberts tanks came out. So it's really been your hobby for the past four years, John. You've actually taken that one step further, haven't you? Yeah, about a year ago I was approached by uh, the publishers of Funky Moped, which was the we documented every moped of the of the moped era, um, and they asked me to write a, a restoration manual based on on my FS1Es, and uh, so that's uh, that's a, a year's work in there. So your, your your book actually just concentrates on on the earlier model, does it? How far does it go up to? It covers most models. It, it really is primarily based on the early models with the pedals, but. The difference between the pedal models and the non-pedal models is generally the pedals, the, the pedal mechanism. You have um, some cosmetic changes that went on from 77 onwards, and they're featured in a, in a reference section at the back of the book, which includes all the brochures. So it, it does give a, a good indication of what each, each model was supposed to look like after 77 as well. So your, bike, your book basically would be a general reference guide for someone wanting to do a... Uh, any type of moped, or can, can you glean it, other information from that? Is there general tips and there tips are, in there? There are tips in there that relate to restoration of any bike, really, but it, it does solely concentrate on the FS1E. What was your first moped then, John? My first moped was a 1975 FS1E DX on a, on a P-Reg. I bought it when I was 15 and started riding it when I was 16 in February 78. And a month later, I, put it, I crashed it into a stationary vehicle, went over the top of the car, landed flat on my back. The bike smashed into the car, bounced backwards, completely smashed the front end. When it bounced backwards, it took out the tail end as well. It cost me £200 to buy it, and it, there was £314 worth of damage. But I had it back on the road within, within a week, and uh, never looked back. Right. Kept Big question, how fast was your fizzy? <laughs> <laughs> it's, difficult, it's difficult to see the speedo when your chin's on it, <laughs> but uh, it was, I would say mine was 50 plus. Yeah, so you're not one of these who said they had a 70 mile an hour fizzy? No, I was, a lot, I was a lot lighter at the time, I don't think I could get 50 out of a fizzy now, <laughs> but um, it, I'm sure it would do 50. Was you hanging around in the crew of, uh, did you have experiences with a lot of group of people when you had a fizzy? Yeah, yeah. A lot of my friends had fizzies. There was probably four fizzy owners with, with me. Two AP50s. Uh, one poor guy had a Honda C50. And uh, there was a, a Gorelli and a Gilera. Yeah. The FS1E was always my choice. I, I wanted one from probably four years before I was old enough to have one. And uh, did various Saturday jobs to enable me to, to buy one prior to my 16th birthday. And um, then all I had to do was earn the money to get it repaired when I smashed it up. Is it, you only had one at that age, did you? How many did you have? I, I, had, I had one FS1 EDX, 
which was the one I, I used. And I bought an FS1, a, a purple FS1E with a few pieces missing and kept that in the, in the back garden for about four years after I sold my DX and then eventually just dropped it off at a broker's yard, which is something I regret to this day. Have you ever tried to find your old physics? Yes. Uh, what went, avenues are there for that? It's, there are various websites you can go on to put your number plate on there and, and hopefully people will come back and say they've got it or they know something about it. Well, thanks very much, John, for letting us have a look at your collection and uh, maybe we'll come back when they've all been finished and completed. Yeah, in about five years' time. Thanks, John. <laughs> okay. Here then, Brent. This is a Gorelli, obviously. What model is it? It's a 1974 Gorelli Tiger Cross Mark II. And the Mark II, you can tell it because it's got this stripe on the tank. The Mark I had a big, thick, black painted stripe down there. And the Mark I had black forks, whereas this has got the, the famous chrome pogo sticks in springs, basically. So you obviously had one of these when you were younger, then, did you? I had an exact replica of this. Well, this is an exact replica of the one I had when I was 16 in 1974 and I was the proudest bloke in our town. So, I mean, what, what drew you to a Gorelli, I mean, rather than the, the, the normal Fizzy or the AP50 or the SS50, for example? Well, I started off with a Mobilette, which is what the government decided that 16-year-olds should have from 1972 onwards. So I had this little Mobilette, step through, pedal and plop thing, and I parked up at school one day, absolutely proud as punch, and I heard this terrific noise coming down a school driveway, and it beep, beep, beep. And I looked up and there was this yellow and black motorbike hurtling towards me and it was a kid in my class. And I thought, how can a 16 year old kid be on what looked like a 250? Anyway, he got off it, Paul Johnson, and uh, I said, what's that? And he said, Gorilla Tiger Cross, fastest moped you can get. And that was it. I was just absolutely hooked. Scrambler back tyre, big yellow and black tank, seat big enough to take a bird on when you was hoping to pull one at the youth club. <laughs> and I was, yeah, that was it. I was desperate to get one. Right, so with regards to the, uh, like the other motors you were about, I mean, what was the brake horsepower of something like this, for example? Well, these had 6.2 brake horsepower claimed, 
Uh, at the other end of the scale, you've got the Honda SS50, which unfortunately only had two and a half. Although it was a really well-made bike, they only had two and a half horsepower, but this had 6.2, and you could get that speed around to 60 mile an hour when you were downhill, where you're bumming the air and your head right down on the tank. I don't think people ever used to tune these, well, obviously because of their power output. Um, I mean, Fizzes and AB50s, for example, were forever being chopped about and tried to be improved upon. But I've never actually seen many of these being changed about. Was that the case back then? That's right. Back in the day, uh, well, not that we had many mechanical skills between us anyway, but there weren't any tuning bits as such. There were some big bar kits, but they, they never seemed to appear in this country till later. Nowadays, it's a different story. A lot of the guys you'll see have got these 70cc Meteor big bar kits on, and they just do give them a little bit more. Um, but I've always stuck with a 50cc one. This is a standard one. Uh, I've never had any trouble with it. What's the, what's the hardest sort of parts for this one? To, I mean, the tyre across the, the source, for example. Seats, correct mud guards, and there's a little pedal cover under here that covers the pedal gear and the toolbox. Them's the hard bits. It seems to be pretty similar, as I say, like with regards to the other mopeds where we're actually covering seats and mud guards seem yeah. to be the standard thing. Yeah. Do you have to? Do you, do you like other people sourcing from eBay or is there specialist clubs at all? Well, there's a, there's, the best club to be in if you've got a moped is the Sports Moped Owners Club, SMOC. It only costs about eight quid a year and you get a newsletter every couple of months and you can put your wanted ads in there and they've got a website now so you can put your for sale and wanted ads on there uh, and that's the way to go I think the problem is that parts are all drying up now there's only a finite number to start with and obviously a lot of them have been skimmed off over the years most of the shops have been trawled over the last 10-15 years and all the stuff's gone now but there's, there's little bits people have got tucked away in the sheds and garages and there's bits that keep coming on the market is this one you've actually refurbished yourself, or did you buy this like this? Uh, I've, I've restored about seven or eight Gorillas, and I bought this one. It was half done. Um, the guy who'd done it, Toby, had made a really good job of the engine. The engine, I've not had to touch the engine, and that's about 15 years ago now. Uh, and I, I put a new tank on it, new seat, new handlebars, new mud guards, toolbox. Uh, had a few bits of chromium done, new backlight. So this one, it was like an half strip down and, and finish off job really, rather than the other ones what I've done, which have been right down to the last nut and bolt and start again. I mean, mopeds were obviously well thrashed by teenagers when they first come out. I mean, what were they like for reliability, these things? To be honest, these weren't as good as the Japanese bikes. I mean, the Fizzy was good and the Honda SS50 was unbelievable. They were a lot better made bikes, they were better engineered, everything fitted together well. These were built down to a price, but they were highly tuned. And you put a 16 year old on a highly tuned moped, he's going to thrash it every day of its life. That's what I did with mine. Absolutely caned it to bits until it blew up. And I think that's what everybody did. So you could get one of these and get three or four thousand miles out of them, and then you'd have a big blow up and you'd have to have an engine rebuild. And then you're back on the road again doing the same thing. Whereas the SS50, although it was crawling along in the back lane, uh, it was a lot more reliable. It used to tick over like a Swiss watch compared to these. But when they were going, these were great. Do you actually keep them as standard as possible? Yeah, it's, this, this one's completely standard, uh, except for the back wheel. Everybody has one little touch that they put on a bike, and I've got a slightly bigger back wheel rim on there, but apart from that, it's standard. Um, I think these days, mopeds are more reliable than ever. I mean, with fully synthetic oil to mix with a petrol, uh, that makes a difference. And the new, NG, the new generation of NGK spark plugs, you just never seem to get a, a foul plug like you used to get back in the 70s that you don't need to decoke them, they just keep running. This one, I've done, oh, I guess I've done about five, 6,000 miles on it, and I've not had to touch the engine over the last 15 years. I've done, the most I've done on it in a day is 300 miles, and although I had a sore backside at the end of that, uh, the bike was still running perfect. So what's how many gears is this one got then? Four speed box, manual clutch. Clutch is a real strong point on them, the clutches just never seem to wear out. And that's one of the spares that's always available is new clutch plates because you just never need them. So this is obviously refurbished. I mean, what sort of money would this command in today's market? Uh, you're looking at about, for this one, about 2,300, I would guess. But if you want to start, you start with a wreck, you can buy something for about 400 quid. And then you're going to have to pour about two grand into it. And how long it will take you to refurb one? Well, I actually kept a record of when I did one and it took me 300 hours. I just used to put a tick every time I went in the garage and had an hour. And about 300 hours should see one finished. And that's for somebody like me who's not exactly a mechanical genius. Right, so now the big moment, Brent. Uh, let's see how you start one of these things up. Okay, mate. Easy peasy with a grilly. Turn the petrol on. Little bit chore. Little bit of a tickle on this, little tickler on the cab. And fingers crossed, it'll start first time.
you want real sound effects, you've got to listen to the horn on this way. Remember that? Brilliant. Um, let's pull the older Honda SS50 in and see what we can do with that. Okay then, will Uh, SS50, uh, Brent, uh, yeah. they did two models of this, obviously, I understand this is the four-speed model, the earlier model, uh, the later model, obviously, had, I think it was a drum brake and uh, handlebars were rubber mounted as well, I gather. Yeah, this, this, this was the first model, uh, four-speed gearbox, drum brake, they later brought out a slight updated one, different colour petrol tank with a disc brake, and an extra speed in the gearbox and a little bit more poke, a bit, bit of an alteration to the carburetor, but this one only had two and a half horsepower. This, this actual bike was my mate Steve Gill's bike back in 1973 and uh, I had a mobilette and when he turned up on this, wow, what a difference, you know, it's all these little knobs and levers all over it, uh, but when I got my Grilly Tiger, this suddenly seemed all that because it was so slow. They were really reliable and really well made, but when you're 16, you're not thinking about reliability and well made, you're just thinking about, I want the biggest, fastest bike I can get, and unfortunately these didn't quite do it, but they're a brilliant little bike, and I didn't see my mate Steve for about 20 odd years and I was in a pub one night back in my hometown in Goole and I bumped into him and I just said, hey, you still got your SS50 Steve for a joke? And he said, yeah, it's still in the garage. So I ended up, cut a long story short, I bought it off him, restored it up a bit and what a disappointment. The engine was just totally gutless and I couldn't get over about 25 with my vast bulk. Uh, so I, uh, I put this bigger engine in, which is a 110cc and uh, it's, it's a genuine 65 mile an hour job now. Uh, although the brakes and the handling and the suspension are at 65 mile an hour, the engine is. So I mean originally then the four-speed model, is the five-speed model more powerful or is it just because cosmetic changes? No, it did have a little bit more power. They altered the carb a little bit uh, and they give it the extra speed in the gearbox and they were definitely a better bike for it. But it was too late by then. The Yamaha FS1E was king of the street for the Japanese bikes and the Gorellis and the Fantics were king of the Italian mopeds. So I think the, um, the FS1E, for example, I think that, that averaged about 4.5 brake horsepower. That's right, yeah. The, the FS1E, again, was a really well-made bike compared to the Gorelli stuff at the time. Uh, everything, all the fittings were nice, everything was properly made, everything fitted together well. And these things, they just kept going. They just kept going forever. No matter what you ran them on, no matter what petrol it was, paraffin even, they just never stopped. Again, I mean, these, these mopeds, for example, as I say, this was one of my first mopeds. In fact, it was the first moped I had. Oh, yeah. Um, and no, no one I can remember having one ever bothered tuning them. No, no. Uh, the only things they ever did to them was you could stick a C70 barrel on the end and a few few alterations, you could come up with a slightly big bar and that did make a difference, but the guys I knew who tried to do that, their bikes kept blowing up, so it was not not really recommended in, in them days. Well, basically, back in the early 70s, I mean, mopeds, sports mopeds, was basically dominated by the two-stroke engine. This being a four-stroke engine, what would have, well, if there was any benefit to a teenager to owning one of these? Well, they were a little bit cheaper to start with to buy. They were about 170 quid at the time, Gorelli's was 200. Um, the, 
the main thing about the economy on them was the, the four-stroke engine. You'd get about 150 miles to the gallon out one of these, which is incredible if you went steady. Uh, and the best I've got out my Gorelli, my Gorelli Tiger, has been 100 miles to the gallon, so a little bit more economical, cheaper to run. And you didn't constantly have to take them back to the shop to get them repaired because they just kept going. This one, when my mate had finished with it, his dad used it for going to work on for about 10 years, every day. I mean, it was pretty rusty when I got it, but it just never let him down. Was it a complete bike, obviously? It had yeah, to be about and... complete bike, but all covered in rust. Every bit of it covered in rust. And Steve's dad, bless him, had covered most of it in gloss paint to try and hold the uh, rust off over the years. But amazing. It still went. We pulled it out of his garage, and it had been stood there for 10 years. Put a drop of petrol in, and it started straight up, just like that. For the sake of uh, keeping things original, did you actually keep the original engine in case you sell it at any stage? Or? Yeah, I did. I, I actually restored it and put the original engine in it, but um, when I went for my test ride, I realised that I was going to be overtaken by milk floats and people on push bikes, so I decided on the, the bigger engine. Right, with regards to keeping these uh, SS50s on the road and re refurbishing them, for example, we know there is a, a Yamaha website for the fizzes, there are various websites that uh, cater for other uh, types of mopeds. I don't think I've actually seen one for the Honda. Is there one or? Uh, I don't think there's one devoted entirely to it, although there are people in the Sports Moped Club who's got them. But the best source of spares for Hondas, any Honda really from the 70s, is Dave Silver Spares. I think he's in Lyston in Suffolk, and I've had quite a few bits off him. And they're great. Those guys just know all the parts numbers. They've got most of them in their head. They don't even need the microfish numbers. And if you want a new exhaust or some new bits and bobs, they've generally got most of it in stock on the shelf, which is incredible. Not just for little ones, but for the bigger ones as well. So, I mean, what are we looking at uh, for an SS50? We, we know roughly the price of your Gorelli's, what they come on now. I don't think these are as popular, but no. they have obviously still got a market. I mean, yeah. what can you expect to pay for a restore by these? Then? Well, you never get back what you're paying restoring them. Um, they're cheaper to buy because they were less popular and less people want them. People want the fastest, the mopeds they had when they were 16. You can get a decent one, an original one, for about eight or 900 quid. Uh, a restored one, it all depends. I mean, how long's a piece of string? Depends how good the restoration job is, depends what you've had poured into it. It'll cost you the same to restore this as it will to restore a Gorelli, but it won't be worth as much at the end. But if you want one to buy and run and keep, then you don't think about the cost of them. Right, so this is obviously your SS50, Brent, with um, obviously a bigger engine in it, but yep. anyway, let's see this one start up. Okay then, Japanese sophistication, ignition key. Didn't get that on a Gorelli, I'm afraid. Ignition on, choke on, Petrol on, and I'll bet you this will start first turn. How was that for you? Perfect. 
everything is all right? Yeah, perfect. Looking good. Don't let anybody ever tell your SS50s are slow. <laughs> well, that's got a 110cc engine in it. It has a little bit, yeah. <laughs> it just gives you that bit more poke, as you probably noticed. <laughs> Brilliant. This is a Gorelli record. It's quite a late one, one of the last ones they did. I restored a couple of the, well, I restored three of the other ones with very similar, very similar looking thing. Slightly different frame on the early ones, slightly different wheel sizes, but basically the same thing. Um, this was a little bit more updated, and you've got a five speed gearbox on it, uh, but very, very similar thing, 49cc. Quite unusual for a company to actually bring out two types of sports moped of the same type. Yeah, they had the, the scrambler type, trail bike type, Gorelli Tiger, and this was the more road orientated one. Now, in the area I lived, the Tiger outsold this one by about 10 to 1, because it looked a bit more raunchy, you know, knobbly tyres, that kind of thing. And this was the more sensible one. So this basically was a more road going as opposed to the Gorelli Tiger Cross, which was more of a an off-roady type thing to it, is it? That's right, yeah, back in the 70s, the four-speed one, uh, the, the record was actually slightly faster on top-end speed because it had a bigger back wheel and, and a smaller back sprocket and it just had the edge on the tires at about one and a half mile an hour and when you were laid over the tank, the record could just get you when you was on your tiger. Is that what streamlining does, yeah? That's it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Even with your head right down on there and your bum right up there, the Gorilla record would just edge past you. So what about the engine in this one then? Is this different, uh, different, is this different from the actual Tiger Cross? Uh, very similar engine. All the Grelly engines were almost exactly the same. Just the difference with this later one, they moved the gear change over to the left hand side because Grelly's were always quite different to everybody else. They had the gear change on the right hand side. So this was the later one. They moved the gearbox, the gear change over to the other side. Uh, apart from that, the same engine. Was there many of these about? I don't recall the actual record when I was younger. There weren't as many. There weren't as many. The Tiger was the one. When people spoke about Gorellis, they always wanted a Gorelli Tiger Cross. And the record, my mate Brian got one, but the only reason he bought one was that they didn't have any Tigers left. And, and that seemed to be the way it went. People wanted Tigers. Tiger, the biggest sellers, the Yamaha FS1E and your Gorelli Tiger was your, was your main sellers. So yet again, Brent, I mean, this is another restored version. Um, you obviously, did you do this or did someone? No, I didn't do this. A pal of mine, Colin Glass in Scotland, did this one. And he's made a lovely job of it as well. He stripped it down to the last nut and bolt, I've got the frame, had the frame powder coated, he sent the tank and the mud guards and the toolbox away for, pow for, for painting, and he's done a lovely job, got the stickers put on it, new headlamp, new handlebars, all new bits and bobs, brand new seat which is lovely, new shockers, they had the exhaust re-chromed, all the usual stuff, you know, powder coating, polishing, chrome, chroming, all that kind of stuff, had the wheels rebuilt, new rims, new spokes, new tyres, everything. It's actually probably better, it's a better quality finish, Colin's done such a good job, than you would have got with a new one out the shop at the time to be honest. The, the Italian paintwork in the early 70s and the electrics wasn't that good, so this is, this is better than new. But it's obviously, this will be a 6 volt model then, will it? Yeah. Well, yeah, the, it's, interestingly enough, Gorelli's was the ones that, that didn't have batteries. Your Honda SS50 and your FS1E, they had a bit more sophistication, they didn't have batteries, but with this last gasp record, they put a little, uh, little battery in so that they could incorporate these little indicators, which are uh, not really right for a Gorelli, in my opinion, but that, that was right at the end of the day when people wanted a bit of uh, refinement. So, is this similar sort of a speed capabilities, for example, with the teenager of the well, this, interestingly, um, because this is a later one, this came out af just after they'd restricted them, and the way they restricted them was with a smaller carburetor and a, a more mildly ported barrel. Now this one's had a, a standard barrel put on, so it's nearly back to top speed, and all it needs putting on it is a carburetor, and it'll be good for 60, fingers crossed, the same as the Tiger. So what year was this model in? Well, this was actually a 78 one, but it wasn't registered till 81. So this is one of the uh, uh, post-77? Yeah, what, what happened was um, the government of the day saw that there's so many teenagers being injured and killed on sports mopeds that they decided to change the legislation yet again 
and from the 1st of August 1977, all less registered on bikes in other words, they were restricted to 30 mile an hour and that was the end of the sports moped era really. Although a lot of kids got these and tuned them up, it was the end of the era really and uh, bikes that had been registered before then were able to command a premium until they were thrashed mercilessly to death and then eventually there was nothing left and you, you just come up to date with kids on the 30 mile an hour scooters today and they're still tuning them up now. I mean, obviously, since 1972 to 77, when the, um, the, the mopeds had to have pedals on, I think. Yeah, that's right. Is it after, I noticed this one hasn't got pedals on. That's right. Well, the, the way it worked was, up until 1972, if you were 16, you could get on anything 250cc, stick a pair of L plates on, and off you go. So lots of people, lots of 16-year-olds being killed on 250s. So the, cha the government changed the legislation so that they decided to restrict people to 50cc. And what they thought would happen was that people would have little pedal and plop type Gorellis and Mobilettes that they could do 25 mile an hour on. So your apprentices could still get to work, your college boys could still get there at 16, uh, and that's the way the government thinking was. Unfortunately for the government, and fortunately for us, the manufacturers spotted this gap in the market for fast 50cc bikes, and Yamaha were right on the ball with their FS1E, and Gorelli just adapted one of their 50cc motorcycles, and charged straight in, and suddenly, from people doing 25 mile an hour on step throughs, you had people getting on sports mopeds and doing double that speed, well into the 50s. Uh, and that lasted until 77, and then they decided to change the legislation again and went, right, we're going to kill it for good this time. No matter what they do, you're not allowed to do over 30 mile an hour. So if this was a pre-77 uh, record, would, would that have failed on it? Yeah, that's right. All, all the bikes at the time, to, to sort of uh, count as a moped, had to have pedals that you could actually pedal the bike along on and what you had to do on the Gorelli for instance was take the spark plug out put it in gear and pedal and you could actually walk 10 times as fast but after 77 they went okay we'll drop the pedals you can have a kick start again but your top speed's restricted to 30 mile an hour. So when you take these bikes from an MOT now for example I mean if you've got one uh, 72 to 77 model for example with pedal gear does that pedal gear have to work? No they don't check that they don't even know what it is most of them but I have to say that the new rigorous MOTs that they're putting mopeds through now, it's quite scary. Uh, I took my Gorelli Tiger over there last month and uh, I was on the rolling road with it and it's, it's unbelievable the way they test them. It passed, but um, I mean the brakes, the brakes were really just, they were pushback brakes really, but they've still got them on the rolling road and they put you through the full Monty. So it's a bit scary, but you can still get past. Right, well now we're moving on to the uh, Fantic, uh, Brent. Uh, this obviously isn't one of the most popular uh, models of, of the era, but I mean, this is obviously one that isn't restored. Uh, what can you tell us about this then? What is it? Well, this particular one, it's Fantic Caballero 4-speed. Uh, similar sort of thing that was used over here, but this one's this was an import. It's never been registered in this country, but they look basically the same. Uh, they didn't sell too many of these. Fantic, uh, similar to Gorelli in a lot of ways, in that they were very Italian-built, they were a fast engine, but uh, very short-lived. They were a bit of a candle that burned very fast. Um, they, they started off with the smaller bikes, with the TI and the Super T, but they didn't sell very well because people, at 16, you wanted the biggest bike you could get. And look, this is still a physically big bike today. Even though I'm uh, bigger and fatter and all around a bigger chap than I was in them days, this, was still a, this is still a big bike now. And that's what people wanted. That's what 16-year-olds wanted. You wanted to be able to impress your mates that you had a big bike, be able to pull a bird because you had a motorbike. This, this was it. You wanted to be the man with a big knobbly tired bruiser like this. Uh, so they brought out this one, which was physically bigger. The TIs are down here. It's physically a bigger bike. Uh, it goes very well, but uh, again, the same as the Gorellis. They were thrashed by 16 year olds and they're constantly back in the shops having to have new pistons and piston rings. So, what were these? I mean, what, what, what's the capabilities of this engine? I mean, just slightly. Um, slightly slower than the Gorelli but the, the beauty of this engine is they're eminently tunable and you can you can really make these fly if you want uh, especially the six speed one they did a six speed one that they put in in this as well 
and they put it in the Fantic chopper and, and in the Super T. And that six-speed engine could really fly. The problem with them was, with the, the early iron-barreled ones, of which this is one, that uh, they'd run great for about 20 miles flat out, and then after that they would go explode big time. So unless you're a bit more relaxed with your throttle, they would blow up on you. I mean, this one obviously, as you say, is in, in the original condition, it's yeah. been restored. Is it no. a road going bike? Or? Yeah, it is a road going bike. It's got the old lights on the front and back. Um, and it, it, would, it, would, it would restore up and be a decent bike to go on moped runs on this. Probably worth only about 600 quid, but for 600 quid, you've got a bike that's running, ready to go, and just wants, uh, just wants tweaking for the MOT, really. So, I mean, people get too much into returning bikes to concourse condition. Yeah, it's great. I've done it myself. I'm as guilty as everybody else. But sometimes it's nice just to have a bike that's, you know, a bit tatty around the edges. You don't kind of use it if it's raining or snowing, you're not bothered. And you just get on it, use it when you want to nip down the shops. And uh, I had one of these last year. Well, I had a Fantic GT the other year, and I used that for a couple of years just for running around on general errands. And it was great, and I never worried about it getting wet because it was already rusty. So this would be a good bike to do that on, I reckon. So with regards to, again, sourcing parts, you haven't really gone down the avenues of... Of, of looking at restoring this thing to be honest with you. No, I don't think I'll look at restoring this one, but it's not a problem if you did. Because the wheel rims you can get from anywhere, spokes you can get anywhere, so you can get your wheel rims redone, paint you can get done, seats you can have recovered. Um, you know, this would all re chrome up, this would re chrome, the frame would be nice if it was powder coated. You can do anything, you can, you can rebuild anything, nothing is impossible, and no matter what parts you think, oh god, I'll never get this, if you start restoring one, you'll usually finish it. I've actually never seen one of these before. I mean, when I was, as I say, 16, um, I think the one that people used to go for, uh, definitely where I used to live, was the, the Fantic, the, the GT model. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what, how did this differ from the GT, for example? The GT had the slightly later engine in it, had the alloy barrel, the aluminium engine, so the engine on them was actually better. Uh, in that it was more reliable and again they were they were eminently tunable as well they could really be made to fly so they were a good bike the gt very similar to this just a slightly different tank road going tires in this the, the the gt was the record version of the tiger whereas this is like the equivalent of the Gorelli tiger this was the the trail bike type uh, gt sold quite well uh, but this was this was the one that a lot of people wanted because it looked so big well let's see how this thing starts up then Brent. okay then fresh from the shed <laughs> five-year-old petrol Let's have a look. Petrol on. Handlebar mounted choke. A bit of refinement for them days. Give her a kick, see if she'll go. Yeah, it does sound a bit. I'm not sure if all the baffles are in that exhaust. <laughs> yeah, I think it'd still get through the MOT though. But uh, yeah, they're a nice little bay. It's amazing to say like your collection has been sitting in your, in your garage for so many years. And yet, I mean, do you obviously start them up now and again? Or? Yeah, um, well, actually, I've sold a lot of my bikes now. I had three times this amount at one time, but I sold a lot of the restored ones. I've hung on to my Gorelli Tiger Mark II, which is the same as I had when I was 16, and I use that all the time. That's constantly taxed and tested. If it's dry, I'll go out on it. If it looks cloudy, I'll still go out on it. Um, I mean, I restored that Tiger 12, 13 years ago, and I've used it ever since, and it still looks in good condition. It's still nice and tidy. So, yeah, I've still got one or two. I'm hanging on to one or two of them.
So again, I mean, you've taken your passion one step further as well. What have you got there in front of you? Oh, this is yeah, the, the bumper book of sports mopeds and bikes up to 250 from the 70s. Buy now well stock yeah. last. A few stories of restorations on Gorillas I've done. Uh, it's basically all the 50ccs that we had at the time. FS. 1E, Honda SS50, Fantic Chopper, and then I, I did all the up to 250s as well, I did the Honda 125s, 250s, RDs, all that kind of stuff. It was just, just a bit of fun really and uh, eventually brought it out as a book, so there is you that, go. Is that bike you've worked on yourself, is it your own book? Yeah, there's, there's some stories in there, restorations of how I restored a couple of Gorelli records and blow by blow accounts of me fighting with spanners and hammers while I was doing my Gorelli Tiger up and re-chroming bits and bobs and because I, I have no mechanical skills at all, so I tell the story as a complete incompetent that I am. Uh, but even I, it's just a matter of patience. As long as you just keep plugging away at it, you'll restore a moped. If I can do it, trust me, anybody can. Right, so in 1972 then, Brent, I mean, what, what were the government expecting us to write about them? Well, I think this is a typical example, Martin. Gorelli stepped through, I had a Mobilette step through, very similar to this. 25, 30 mile an hour. Good reliable little tool, get you to work and back, but not exactly what the 16 year olds wanted at the time. I had one of these and it was great, until I saw a Grelly, then I wanted a Grelly Tiger. Right, let's give her a start, turn the petrol on, give a kick, powerful beast. A little spin around on this one then. Right, Brent. So we've obviously seen your collection now. I mean, what seems to be the attraction of uh, these uh, bikes to you? I guess it's instant nostalgia, Martin. Uh, it takes you back to a time when you were 16, when all you were worried about was going down a chip shop, down a youth club, trying to pull some birds somewhere. Uh, I've got modern bike as well. I've got a super bike, and I've got old British bikes as well. But keep coming back time after time. The most fun I ever had in my life was on a Grelly Tiger, and I reckon I still am now. I think us guys in the moped club. Some people might think we're sad, but I reckon we're just the oldest swingers in town. I've had this one about four months. Right, and this again is another eBay find, is it? Yeah, I got it from eBay. It came from Germany originally. But yeah. it was an English, it was an English bike, it's unregistered. And as you can see, it's in pretty good condition. Yeah. Did you obviously have an AP50 when you were 16? Or... Yeah, first, first moped I ever had was exactly the same as this baby here. Same colour, everything. And um, it's brought me back to when it reminded me of when I was 16 again. So you actually, you're actively collecting these now, or do you just yep. like... Yep, I'm collecting them, I've got some fizzies, uh, APs, and I've got a 250 X7. I mean, I always remember the AP50 back when I was uh, 16, that it was, it was physically, it looked physically a bigger bike than the, uh, the, the fizzy. I mean, is that what drew you to it? Um, well, not really, I just like the looks of it. I went to a bike shop when I was about 15 and a half, dreaming about, I would have settled for anything, but I'll see a blue AP50 there, and um, I mean they're just bigger than the fizzy. The tank's bigger, the seat's bigger. It is a it's a, it's a bigger bike. It looks to me it looked more like a motorbike. So as opposed to the fizzy, I think the fizzy had four speed gearbox, which was four down. This was more like a, 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 like a normal motorcycle, which was one down four up. So yep, one down speed. four up, five speed gearbox. Um, made them a little bit quicker than the fizzy as well on acceleration because of the gear ratio. 
so they could pull away quicker. They had a slightly, slightly better top end, although a lot of physio owners would deny that. This is, a, as I say, this was over in Germany, this bike. Um, you brought it back into the country. It needs registering, I gather, is that correct? Yep, I've got to register it. I've just got to work out how to do that. I haven't got round to it yet. I've been a bit busy. But I'm going to register it and I'm going to use it for myself. It's not going to be, it's not going to be something I polish up and leave in the shed. I'll be using it. Between this bike and a, a, an English bike, is it only the speedometer? Speed well, the speedometer is in kilometres, but this bike was originally English, so I'm not sure whether maybe just slightly because these are one. I'm sure it's one of the first ones. It's an early '75. It might be that they came in kilometres. I, I can't remember to be honest. What about this one? It's obviously this is in genuine condition. Yeah, it's all genuine. It's all genuine parts. It's a it's, it's a good find. Will you, uh, will, you be, will you be just tidying it up and making, making it into a concourse position? Or yep. are you actually going to be using it as well? I'm going to be using it for travelling about, just, just little journeys. I will tidy it up. I mean, it's got a bit of rust down here, but I'll, I'll re-spray that, give it a good polish up, and then I'm going to use it. But unlike when I was 16, I'll look after it. I'll wash it regular and look after it with a bit of, bit of love and care. What was your original one? Was it the same colour as this? Same colour, blue. It's just exactly the same. Exactly so it just reminds me of it, the only thing this ain't got is the chrome mirrors. Right, yeah. Did you uh, hang about with a load of like, kids at the Oreo? Oh, yeah, yeah, we had our little, our little moped gang. I mean, I always remember what drew me to motorbikes. One day there was just this gang of uh, motorcyclists or mopedists shot by on a, all on fizzies they were, and they had to cut through a little bend. And they all leaned over one side, and they leaned over the other side to go round, and it, it just looked good and I thought I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind a motorbike. How did you find the brakes on these, being a drum brake front and back? <laughs> Back's okay because you've got the power but the front's not, not very good. Yeah. On, I don't think on any of them on the fizzies, mate, unless, apart from the DX the disc brake model, they're, they're, not, they're not that great. You couldn't lock them up anyway. I mean these, I, I, I can't remember the exact year these come out but I mean the fizzy came out in 1972 I think and it started off as the SS. There's a model before the AP50, which is, I, I haven't got one of them, no, but it was the A50. Right. It used to have an upswept exhaust. Oh, right. I used to own one of them, yeah. but the, I've got the, I've got the, uh, the one past this, the restricted one, the A50K. The other one was just an A50, it had a shorter tank right. and, and an upswept exhaust. That was pre this model? Yeah, yeah, I think, I, I think these came out, I'm not positive, was either N or P Ridge. Right. I don't think they came out before that. Someone will correct me, but... And, and the other one, that, that would be post-1977, 1st of August 1977. Yep. Uh, what was that one? Th this one's 75. Right, okay. And the one, the other one, the, the, the 30 mile an hour one, that was the A50 again, they changed again. 78 upwards, yeah. Right. yeah. And that would have been restricted, obviously. That, they were restricted to 30 miles an hour, I think. That's, how did that vary to this, this bike you've got in front of you? Well, it's exactly the same, really. It's got a slightly different coloured tank. Yeah, they dropped the pedals, though, did they? Um, you've got footrest instead of pedals. Yeah. Um, and I think it comes with a side stand as well. Yeah. You know, but apart from that, I think the handlebars are slightly different. Yeah. But almost the same. What was the restriction? How did they restrict these things? Um, well, I know on uh, the early restrictions, it used to be a washer in the exhaust. I think on the A50K is a, a jet restriction in the oh, carburetor. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know this one doesn't need any parts, Rob. I mean, you probably just plate a few things and get a refinishing job on the, like the uh, chain case, for example, with the, the pedal gear. But I mean, uh, what's the hardest parts to source for these sort of bikes? I, I, I don't know. I mean, we, we, we've had mud guards, we've had seats on the uh, fizzes and the Corellis and stuff like that. Is it pretty similar to this? It, the uh, it's not. There's not much difference, although mud guards are that rule quite available for fizzes. Front mud guards have stopped making original. The hardest things to get for these is the swinging arms, because they rot. Um, swinging arms and seats, obviously, you ain't going to find one. Something like a seat like this goes for about 300 quid on eBay, which is uh, exhausts are available, patterned exhausts. 
Um, I think it's really the swinging arms and mud guards that you can't really get hold of. Is there any websites dedicated to the AP50 at all? Well, there's the Suzuki Owners Club, but I've not I've not really looked for dedicated AP50 site, or I've not found one. Not like like the FS1E site. Do you actually source your parts from eBay as well? Then? Most of my parts, nearly all, come from eBay. Oh, I did forget to mention these things here. These chain guards are virtually impossible to get as well. But I've managed to get a new one off of eBay, and sometimes I phone up the dealers because you you'll be surprised. Some dealers do have some old stock. Yeah. Speaking to the uh, the other enthusiasts, they say that quite a lot of the dealers have been like trawled through basically from people store bikes and it's getting harder and harder to find parts. So are you going to go down the road and refurbish parts yourself for example? Well I am yeah I mean I'm gonna I'm gonna I've got some swinging arms some AP swinging arms in my garage that I'm gonna repair and repaint and the same with any part that I can re-chrome I'm gonna re-chrome I'd rather do that anyway than than try and try and ring about for parts. So I know you've got some uh, AP50s and fizzes in your garage I mean what, what is your passion? My passion really is the AP50 that that's that's the one I really wanted. The one that's here now is the one that is going to stay with me. My red one that I've got, that's, that I've had for over 20 years, it's all in bits. And this one, you know, these are my real passion. And I'll keep a fizzy as well and maybe just refurbish the rest and might sell them on. I'm not sure yet. Well, we've all heard stories about what these things can actually achieve, top speed. What did your one do, the one that you had? I, I got, I mean, I can be believed or not, but I, I was about nine stone and I was going slightly downhill, tanking it, leaning over the tank, and I actually clocked 65 on it. Was that on standard gearing as well? Standard gearing, bog standard bike. Yeah, you won't be in tow by a car, would you? I may have, no, I may have <laughs> just cut the baffle down a little bit, that was all. Right, yeah. But I mean, you, you actually think these were faster than the, the fizzies? Yeah, I always, I always used to beat the fizzies, you know, I mean, when we, we used to race from, from start to finish top end, they always used to just have the edge on it, there weren't a lot in it, but it always used to have the edge, the bike I had anyway, because you could find some were slightly faster than others, and it's always the way, it's the same with cars. Did you ever bother tuning yours? No, not really. I left it bog standard. I may have, I think I pulled it out a little bit. Okay then Rob, just like all the other bikes we've featured, let's hear this thing start up again. Right, I'll switch the old petrol on. Chuck it on reserve, it's probably got none. Switch the key on. Choke, and hopefully it'll start. <laughs> I haven't driven one for years. Brought back memories. Yeah, certainly has. Tuned RD400 stroke FS1E. Right, this is placing RD400. What is it? The efficient points? Points, points version, yeah. How did you get off the line in the end now? Did you have a problem with that at all? A few hours of hard work, but basically I lined the chain up first. Uh, well, I broke the speed up on it, and I probably had about just over the 100 out of it. You've had over 100 out of that, yeah? Yeah.
What about um, have you upgraded anything else? Or is it literally just the basic the fizzy chassis? Just the fizzy chassis, yeah. Yeah. So it's a basic fizzy chassis, no modification, no strengthening, you've just literally blocked an RD4 underneath it. That's it. And the old one to bring there. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.